May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be worthy in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. This coming Thursday, Maundy Thursday, Lent will come to an end. I know many give up something for Lent, as I do some years. Whether you did so or not, there can be no doubting that this year it might have seemed that the world gave, on, gave up on us for Lent. Stuart Langshaw posted a meme from Episcopalians Online which really said it all. This is the Lentiest Lent I've ever Lent. On Ash Wednesday, February the 26th, as in previous years, we were reminded, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. By that same day, 82,000 cases of COVID-19 had been recorded globally since the first case on January the 10th, 23 of those in Australia. 2,700 had resulted in death by then, but none of those in Australia. Lent is due to finish on Maundy Thursday. On current trends, by then those figures will have grown globally to over one and a half million and 100,000 deaths with Australia looking at the prospect of 10,000 cases with a total of about 100 deaths. Australia has fared comparatively well and we should give thanks to all those who have played key roles in that being so. Doctors, nurses and carers who are directly on the front line. Health agencies with their epidemiologists and contact tracers who are key parts of the containment of the virus those making policy and regulations for community protection and well-being, from the Prime Minister down, including the bipartisan National Cabinet, as well as federal and state governments. And also all Australians who are doing their bit physically to physically distance themselves, isolate when necessary, yet at the same time showing social togetherness through offering succour to those who are at risk or in economic need, or comfort to those who are anxious about the uncertain months ahead. To varying degrees, we are all feeling anxious about the situation. I don't know about you, but I have actually felt myself in something of a wilderness during this time. A spiritual wilderness, though, not a spiritual desert, for I have never doubted that God reigns, and through Christ, his will be the ultimate victory. I resonate with Psalm 118, read this morning during the Liturgy of Palms. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. These words speak with certainty, with truth. Yet they were written by David, who would also write when he was in the wilderness fleeing from Saul, O oh God, you are my God, Eagerly will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you as a dry and thirsty land where no water is. David knew what it was to spend time in a spiritual wilderness, yearning, thirsting for God. I guess that speaks to how I have been feeling in these past weeks. Jesus too spent time in the wilderness there he was tempted by Satan and was waited upon by angels. We know this from Mark 1.13. There we also read that Jesus was with the wild beasts. Some years ago, when I put myself through a rigorous Lent to help my spiritual seeking, there were times when my journey was not only hard, it was deeply confronting. I mentioned this to Peter Burke from Anglicare, who responded with a question. If Jesus encountered beasts in the wilderness, why did you not expect to encounter fauna of the night? His phrase, fauna of the night, came from a poem by Jim Cotter. His question spoke profoundly to me then, and during this past Lent in the context of COVID-19, has done so again. These beasts I encountered were not for personal reasons, but for the sake of all of us, not just here, but globally. I've been distressed by reports of a predicted tsunami of deaths in countries both rich and poor. 
it has left me feeling a sense of helplessness. Additionally, there has been a deep concern about the economic capacity of the world to provide for all humanity following the huge disruption that the virus has caused. We know of the economic toll here, which is mirrored in many Western countries, but it takes on an even greater magnitude in countries of the South. In the wake of an Indian lockdown to combat the virus, a certain Ali Hassan, a street vendor in Allahabad, told a BBC reporter, I'm very scared. I have a family. How am I going to feed them? His was but one voice from among hundreds of millions who would doubtless say the same. In the face of such pleas, are there any blessings at all in what is happening? Dr. Brian Harris, principal of Vaux's College in Perth, has written a blog entitled COVID-19 and Complicated Blessings. In this blog, he tackles the question of what possible good can have come of this 21st century pestilence, which has caused such massive disruption to our world and the lives of all of us. He handles the concept of blessing with caution and humanity, writing, I don't want to downplay the downside. Thousands of people have already lost their lives. Hundreds of thousands more are likely to. I get there is no way you can attach the word blessing to that. Around the world, millions of jobs have been lost and many families are desperately wondering what the future holds for them. I get that you can't attach the word blessing to that. He continues, for some, COVID-19 is a bothersome inconvenience. For others, it is the death of most of what has been held dear. I get that those in the second group would feel a deep sense of betrayal if I attempted to attach the word blessing to what they are going through. But blessings can be complicated and good can come from brokenness. A few moments ago, I quoted Jim Cotter in reference to the fauna of the night. It transpires that these words are the title of a poem, the first verse of which goes, encounter them, contemplate them, dare to look steadily at them, wrestle with them, expect to be wounded in the struggle with them, name them, recognize them, and be blessed by them. If, like me, you have felt in a spiritual wilderness these past weeks, have you been able to dare to look steadily at the fauna of the night and wrestled with them? Brian Harris did, and came up with a list of three complicated blessings. First, we have affirmed that vulnerable people matter and that saving lives is more important than saving the economy. Second, we are being given the gift of slowing down. Perhaps as we stay home, we will discover where home truly is, and we will sometimes discover how broken our relationships are. Third, as most church activities are canceled, we get to ask, so which did we miss? It gives us a chance to ask what it means to be a community of people on a journey of following Jesus. Jim Cotter's poem described the fauna of the night as hidden in the grass of our neglect. As we consider the fauna that prowl in the night of our spiritual wilderness, the fears and the doubts, especially at times such as this, may we find something precious which we may have previously neglected, complicated blessings. Brian Davis asked the question relating to the affirmation that vulnerable people matter. He writes, am I the only one who has noticed that this is a thoroughly Christian response? We might live in a post-Christian era, but protecting the most vulnerable is definitely the Christian thing to do. I suspect it is one that pleases the heart of God. Earlier, I spoke about David in the wilderness of Judah. 
John Donne wrote about this spiritual wilderness, commenting particularly on Psalm 63 and of the inherent hope within that wilderness, whatever might be the fauna of the night. He wrote, David's distress in the wilderness carried him upon the memory of that which God had done for him before, and the remembrance of that carried him upon that of which he assured himself after. Fix upon God anywhere, and you shall find him a circle. He is with you now when you fix upon him. He was with you before, for he brought you to this fixation, and he will be with you hereafter, for he is yesterday and today and the same forever. This is Palm Sunday, a day for waving palms in remembrance of welcoming an earthly Messiah into Jerusalem, which leads to Easter Day, when we will remember our divine Messiah. By Maundy Thursday, after the Last Supper, we will recall Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane, encountering a wilderness where the fauna of the night, fear and uncertainty assailed him. We sense that Jesus wavered in the face of them as he cried, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet he overcame the fears by saying, your will be done. The next afternoon, Jesus would again encounter the fauna of the night as he hung upon the wilderness of the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew's gospel was silent on further words from Jesus, but we know from Luke that once again, he overcame the fauna of the night by saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. On this Palm Sunday, we wave palms no longer reminiscent of the crowds in Jerusalem, but now crafted into a cross, which reminds us that Jesus, through his resurrection, has met us in our spiritual wilderness and ministers to us, commending us to give our spirit into his hands. Hosanna to the King of Kings, lead us from the fauna of our spiritual wildernesses.